welcome to CXWise, the podcast where we share wisdom, insights, stories, and expertise from the world of customer experience. I'm your host, Nathan Bennett, and you're about to hear real world experiences and practical advice that will elevate your CX game, no matter your industry. Our guest today is Howard Tierski, CEO and founder of From, an award-winning digital transformation agency. I think you guys have won something like 100 plus awards. Uh, he's also the author of the Wall Street Journal best-selling book, Winning Digital Customers, The Antidote to Irrelevance. Before he started his own agency, Howard spent 18 years with Ernst & Young, and IDG has named Howard one of the top 10 digital transformation influencers to follow today. Howard, welcome to CXWise. How are you today? I'm awesome. Thanks so much for having me, Nathan. I'm excited to be absolutely, here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I hope we didn't embarrass you by showering you with all of those amazing things, but we are honored to have you here. Oh, listen, uh, my mother's failing right now. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, before we get down to business, let's break the ice a little bit. I'm curious to know, what was your first customer-facing job, and what did it teach you about customer experience? Oof, what an interesting question. Well, you know, I guess when I was in uh, fourth grade, uh, the kids took turns running the school store which sold, you know, pencils and uh, notepads and things like that. And it was your job to go there and, and sell pencils for five cents, whatever else, and then write down on a little clipboard what people had bought. And what did that teach you about customer service and uh, customer experience in fourth grade? One thing I recall was it, it, it taught me the importance of systems and how their impact can be on customer experience because uh, there were usually quite a lot of kids who wanted to get you know uh, their stuff at the store, but they had to be very quiet because they were in the hall. So it was not a delightful thing to wait in that line because you just had to be very, very quiet. And if you talk to neighbor, some teacher would stick her head out of the door and say, be quiet out there, you know? So every kid that bought something, we had to write down on the clipboard their name and what they had bought and the, the cost. And of course, you know, and I didn't have the world's best handwriting either and still don't, but then we'd have to write it all down. It's going to take a couple minutes. And then when you got 20 people in line, you're, you've just turned what could have been a five minute process, two pencils, here you go, two notebooks, here you go into an hour of each kid having to wait while we filled out the paperwork. So uh, we definitely could have given a better customer experience if we'd have had a more efficient point of sale system than a, than a clipboard and a pencil. And, and it wasn't exactly the the one click uh, Amazon Prime to check out uh, experience that we have today. Um, what was the last best customer experience that you had? Last best customer experience that I had. Um, well, I, I, I flew on United Airlines back from Turks and Caicos uh, right. before last. Took my son nice. scuba diving. And uh, one of us got upgraded and one of us didn't. I, you can guess who, which okay. one of us, but I told my son, okay, you should take the first class seat um, since, you know, it's a little more special for him. So he took uh -huh. the first class seat and I went back to coach. And then I was sitting in my seat and I was able to go into the United app and you could pull up the seat. Map. And I'm like, I wonder if there's a better seat that I could, you know, secretly switch to. And then I, so I was able to pull up the United app and see the real time seat map and see that one row back and to my left, there was an entire empty row. Nice. So I went over there and you know sat in the aisle seat on the other side, hoping that no one else would have the same idea and that it wouldn't change. And I was able to even keep refreshing because I'm now, I'm, now I'm invested. So even though I'm not in first class, I've actually got a whole row to myself. So that was a pretty good customer experience and I appreciate That's great. The, uh, the feature. But it's not smart enough to start to get nuanced and say, you know, how has been flying for 20 years? We could look back at you know, hundreds and hundreds, if not more than a thousand flights and see, oh, you know, sometimes he picks an aisle seat, sometimes he picks a window seat. Could we actually figure out the, the, the rules behind that and assign him the seat he likes best based on the time of day of the flight? Something like that's nighttime flight, window seat, daytime flight, aisle seat. So in the future, I look forward to, you know, even smarter automation that figures out over time why I sometimes pick aisle, once, sometimes pick window and, and automatically assigns me based on that. I think that's brilliant. You know what you should do? You should have your own 
digital uh, agency where you could go into <laughs> businesses and tell them this sort of advice or oh, maybe write a book about it. I don't know. Maybe write a book. So as, as you well know, the digital world has changed a lot over the decades and, you know, uh, post COVID it's changed even more and maybe even more suddenly. So what challenges are brands facing today in the customer experience space that perhaps they were not facing pre COVID? Well, I think what we've seen is an accelerated adoption of digital in, in all areas. Um, people were already on an increasing adoption curve of whether it's online banking or ordering, you know, groceries or, you know, ordering takeout food online or using digital ticketing and, and the combination of the enforced, uh, you know, uh, quarantines, which didn't allow people to, to engage at physical businesses and therefore forced people to engage in digital transactions in those cases where they previously might not have. And also post COVID, the desire for touchless uh, and for even when you are engaged in a physical environment to use digital to avoid having to interact with possibly journey pin pads or whatever else it might be, um, mm -hmm. has definitely uh, acted as an accelerant. And so what that means is that I think for a lot of companies, the world was already changing and the customer's priorities and the customer's preferences were already changing faster than the com most large enterprises were able to move. And we see that in big enterprises, whereas an individual customer is much more nimble. And so customers, even if there's millions of them, they're more like a flock of birds than an aircraft carrier. You know, together they may weigh as much as the aircraft carrier, but individually they can each just turn around. And so all of a sudden you've got this very nimble set of customers who are changing their behavior. And then sometimes large companies aren't able to change fast enough. And change means both to provide those capabilities but also to provide them in a way that's really competitive because, you know, it's one thing to say, oh, well, our competitors have buy online, pick up in the store. We need to, we need to have it too. But if you're not able to move quickly and then you wind up with something that's a subpar experience, even when you implement it. And now that becomes an important part of the customer experience when previously it wasn't. And if that's subpar, then you've just taken your customer experience down a couple notches and there's tons and tons of data that show that the quality of someone's experience is as, or in some cases, more influential on their buying decision than is than are some basic traditional ideas like price or you know product mm. quality, things like that. Of course, these are important too, but experience is so important that if you're even if you have the right price and even if you have the right product, if the experience, just like my friends standing out in the hall waiting for their pencils, uh, if the experience isn't <laughs> good, people will look for an alternative. Um, <laughs> But obviously out in the competitive world, people have lots of alternatives. And of course, mm -hmm. when they're in a digital mindset, their alternatives grow. I mean, for example, um, when we get groceries in my household, so we were a household that prior to COVID, we had not adopted digital ordering of groceries. Can't really say why, but we were in the habit of going to the grocery store. Um, so which, how many grocery stores do we have to pick from? Well, really, honestly, like two. Basically, there are two grocery stores mm -hmm. that are a reasonable distance from my house, similar distance. And if we were to go to the third closest grocery store, we'd be diving, driving twice as far. So we have to have a really, really mm -hmm. compelling reason to go fit 20 minutes away instead of 10 minutes away. So probably we would not do that unless there was something very unusual. When I go into Instacart to order my groceries, I don't really care whether it's the 10 minute away store or the 20 minute. As long as they're willing to deliver for free, it doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. So I have a much broader right. range of choices about where to do my grocery shopping. And so if all of a sudden I discover, and frankly, we have another grocery store that has some products that we like, some like healthier organic products that aren't stocked at our regular store. And we've started to do more and more ordering from that store, which is of stores called super fresh. I'll give them a call out. And, um, but it was, it's a little too far to go on a regular basis. So, but this is what digital does. I mean, for most of us, if we wanted to buy a hardware item or an apparel item or a consumer electronics item, Prior to Amazon, we were stuck with whatever couple choices were reasonable driving distance. And now we have nearly unlimited choice because we can order from wherever. We don't even need to know where they are. And FedEx or UPS or Amazon will deliver it to us. So what happens then is you have a much broader set of competitors. And digital is so much more important that if you're not really providing an outstanding digital customer experience, 
someone else is providing a better one and there's a broader range of companies mm -hmm. that you have to stack up against. So that's kind of a double whammy. And then if you combine that with the difficulty of moving quickly that many large enterprises have, I think this is the sort of, uh, this is the trick that they've got to get past. You, you mentioned Amazon and I know we talk a lot about uh, love and brands that are loved and Amazon, a lot of people love Amazon. Some people don't love Amazon, but let's talk about the process of falling in love with a brand. What are those things that a brand can do um, from a customer experience standpoint to get their customers to actually fall in love with them? Yeah, sure, sure. That's one of my favorite topics. So the first thing to you know be aware of is that the goal of a brand should not be to try to get everybody to love them because that's probably right. impossible. But even more importantly than that, that it's impossible is that the attempt to get everyone to love you almost inevitably means you're not going to be able to get anybody to love you. And I'll explain. Anybody to love you, so right. You have to pick who it is that you really want to resonate with. So the question of how to inspire love in customers is one that we've looked at a lot. It started based on a recognition that there's so much data that shows that those customers that inspire an emotional connection with their customers have much higher revenue, profitability, growth, share price. So the question is, how can we inspire? One of the things in the research that we do at my company, working with a lot of big brands, which is that we have hmm. looked to figure out how we can reverse engineer love and understand what those uh, key uh, behaviors are that a brand can engage in to inspire that love. What we've determined hmm. is that there's three primary things that inspire love in customers. And they're in kind of like a pyramid, like a hierarchy. The bottom of the pyramid, the most important is to consistently meet the customer's needs. Make sure that whatever the domain of need is that your brand aligns with, you don't have to meet every need. I mean, Apple doesn't sell me great car insurance, you know, so they're not meeting all my needs. <laughs> not, <laughs> yet. <laughs> not yet. Um, you know, but I mean, Amazon won't, won't you know, give me a prescription if I'm sick. I mean, every brand has its domain that it is focused on, but within that domain, very consistently and reliably meet that person's needs to try to understand to what degree they're meeting their customers' needs. And while it sounds like a very basic thing, it's amazing how many brands are not consistently meeting their customers' needs, and especially in this digital realm. And for reasons we talked about earlier, one of the reasons why it's so tough to meet all their needs there is because their needs have changed a lot in the last few years. So you might have been meeting them a number of years ago, but you got to keep racing in order to stay up with their needs. And so really understanding what are the full spectrum of their needs. And it's not that you can never fall down, that you can never make a mistake, but consistency, right? That doesn't mean perfection, but it means consistency and reliability. So that's the first level. The second level is to occasionally to do something extra that surprises or delights the customer beyond what mm -hmm. their basic needs are. And then the third is to stand for something that the customer resonates with, to stand for something mm -hmm. of value or set of values the customer also shares. Um, which, you know, there are certainly some examples of businesses that have been very successful doing that with values that are, let's loosely say political, like Nike supported mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter, which was tremendous for them. They created so much passion with the customers that they resonated with. One of the things that sometimes we get asked about that is, well, why these three things? Why is this recipe work? And what we've seen is, it's, it's because of, of how people feel. And, and well, let me put it this way. One of the things I learned, I've worked for many years with Tony Robbins in his organization. And one of the things that he teaches is that emotion comes from meaning. What's the meaning that you put on something? You know, if someone hands you a bouquet of a dozen roses, how do you feel? Well, it probably depends on what those roses mean to you. If the roses mean, I love you, you know, you're the most important person in the world to me, then great. If I give roses to somebody who's allergic to roses and I should have known they were allergic to roses and they say, these roses mean you don't understand me at all and you're not thinking you're caring about me because you didn't know I was allergic to roses. And that's a very different meaning at least or a very different feeling, even though it's the same action, giving the roses. You know? So, um, so these three things have some known meanings that we find in our research, which is when you meet someone's needs consistently as a brand, the meaning that the customer derives from that is when they do business, someone's trying to meet some basic level of need, but when, when brands misfire and they don't succeed in meeting the need, very often that's because the conclusion that the customer comes with is like, they don't, they don't get me 
right? They don't understand people like me. This is not a brand for someone like me. And then the second level of meaning is what, what about if someone does something extra? What about if a brand does something that they didn't have to do that delights you? Well, the meaning that customers often get from that is that they care about me. Why? Well, because they didn't have to do that thing. I was giving them my money anyway, mm -hmm. and yet they threw something extra in the box that I love, which shows not only do they understand me, but they care because they didn't do it because they were trying to get the money. And then the third tier, when they stand for a value that I resonate with, the meaning that customers get from that is that in some way, they are like me. They share some mm -hmm. human value with me. They stand for something. They have a humanity that I share. I love that. And one of the things that I really resonate about your approach to customer experience is you understand humanity really well. You understand that there's emotion behind uh, these decisions and that people create a relationship for a reason or for reasons. Um, one of the things that goes along with that approach about speaking to humans is your approach uh, with storytelling. I know you're a great storyteller. What is it about storytelling that brands don't fully realize um, to, what are they not doing well when they're not telling the right story or using storytelling effectively to enhance their brand and that relationship with their customers? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. It's a huge topic. Storytelling is the most powerful tool that we have to get people to pay attention to what we're saying and to remember it. As marketers, so often, that is what we want. And it's challenging to get people to pay attention in a crowded landscape. And it's difficult to get people to remember because even if they paid attention to us, they're gonna hit, get hit with a different message every five seconds or whatever it is. Um, so it's hard to be, it's hard to be remembered. Right. And, and I think one of the things when you ask, you know, what, what brands don't understand, I mean, I think there are many brands that are fantastic storytellers, but I also think that we tend to be very quick to label something a story. You know, if mm -hmm. I explain to you why my product is great, that is not a story. It, a story. it may be useful information to somebody. You know, there are times when a brand doesn't have to fight for my attention because I just want information. Like I'm trying to decide whether to go to this resort or that resort. And I want to understand how many pools it has and how far I have to walk to the beach. Blah, blah, blah. I'm looking for information to make a decision. Well, at that point, I might not want a story. I just want information. So that's fine. Not every piece of communication needs to be in the form of a story, but when you're trying to get my attention, that's where story, and when you're trying to get me to remember something, that's where stories are so important. And a lot of times brands or marketers or just people will label things as stories if they have words and pictures, you know? <laughs> if it's a video, <laughs> it's a story. Well, that's not the case, right. but um, you know, the basic elements of a, the basic element of a story is drama, is conflict. Mm -hmm. Something conflict. is wrong, you know, and yep. somebody is fighting to fix it. And the more the dramatic the story, typically, for evolutionary reasons, the more likely we are to pay attention. You've seen the TV show House. If you watch in any episode of House or many medical dramas or legal dramas or things like that, you wind up learning a lot. Because the person yeah. comes in and they have this problem, right? And there's drama and there's risk, but in order to solve it, they need to do an MRI. And then you're learning about the kidney or the liver or this disease you never heard of, or these treatments that you never heard of. And you actually walk away remembering all kinds of medical information. Now, if someone just did a lecture on, I'm going to tell you about these new treatment modalities for, you know, kidney problems, you'd probably fall asleep but you're paying attention right. because the stakes are raised to understand that medical information in the context of a dramatic human story. And so whatever type of product you have, you want to be thinking about how do you create those kinds of dramatic stories, which don't have to be fictional, by the way, they can be real stories. But so, so that's, I think what the, the power of story. And like I say, what we wind up doing is either not telling stories or creating very low stakes stories stories where the, the solution is too easy. We always want to make it sound like our mm -hmm. product is an easy solution. Well, that's great, but if it's too easy, right. it's not a very good story. I, I love everything you said. So here's, here's where the data comes in to that. You've also said that leveraging data is one of the most important things uh, for digital experiences. So how does the data marry with the storytelling to create those experiences? Mm. Well, this is, this is the frontier. 
that we're on right now, right? Because historically, it's very hard to marry data with story because the same story won't resonate with everybody. Um, but so historically what we do with data is we say, well, let's divide our audience into segments and let's find some way to try to push the right story that resonates with that segment. So if I'm advertising a car and I'm advertising in both Sports Illustrated and also Cosmopolitan Magazine, I might tell a little different story, even if it's the same car, because I kind of think generically, I'm looking at a little different audience and a somewhat different story may resonate. But that's a very coarse instrument. If you're just trying to segment your, your audience into a few big, big categories by age or by, by mm -hmm. gender or by socioeconomic status or geography. Um, the opportunity today is all this data to actually understand the individual customer and figure out what's the story that would work best for them. And this is the opportunity we all have as marketers for, with artificial intelligence. And most of us have had the opportunity to play with chat GPT. And uh, mm -hmm. of course it's astonishing. Um, you know, you can say, you know, I, I, you know, tell me a story about a bear and a coyote and their friendship and how it went wrong. And it will write you a story about that. <laughs> so now all of a sudden, I want to use that as a prompt. Actually, that's a great prompt. Oh my gosh. Um, but you know, if you think about the marketing opportunity to say, if we knew the gender of someone shopping on an e-commerce website and we had product descriptions, but we used AI to rewrite them in a more Southern versus Northern way. You know, if you think about the U.S., right, or a more urban versus rural way, or a more female versus male way. You know, different uh, different reading levels, different uses of more or less adjectives, or whatever. Um, then potentially, and this is, needs to be tested, we at least have the opportunity to try to do a lot more of adapting stories based on what we know about somebody. I think we're going to find, fast forward a few years, that many websites that we look at and many mobile apps that we look at. Are, are providing marketing copy, which has been tailored by AI to at least attempt mm -hmm. to resonate with us based on what their data about us as an individual consumer. Um, speaking of things that were not written by chat GPT, your book, Winning Digital Customers, The Antidote to Irrelevance. Um, first, I want to unpack this title a little bit. So I have two questions. Um, why digital customers? Because it seems like Every customer nowadays is a digital customer. And the antidote to irrelevance, I think, is such a powerful subtitle because that sort of implies that irrelevance is poison. Someone can create a business that doesn't succeed, right? In fact, most businesses mm -hmm. don't succeed. But now let's take businesses that succeed at a massive scale, right? Radio Shack, super successful, right? Of all the businesses that didn't yeah. succeed, they were not that story. Blockbuster. These were companies that were massively successful and then they weren't. So what mm -hmm. happens? And the answer is all to do with relevance. There was a time when Blockbuster mm -hmm. was super relevant to the needs of people yep. in this country on a, every weekend. They wanted to go rent movies and then times changed, technology changed, people's behaviors changed, people's preferences changed, and they didn't change or change fast enough. And so their relevance right. went down. So, so yes, there's no question that, one of the big things that drives formerly successful businesses out of business is that they were relevant and then they start to become less and less and less relevant and they don't figure out how to close that gap and catch up. So I, I do think that irrelevance is poison. You know, to I define a digital customer as someone who's living a lifestyle with digital at the center, who's sleeping with their phone beside their bed, whose preference in most cases is going to be engaged with brands digitally. In most cases, there's always going to be exceptions. Mm -hmm. I would generally say 65% or more of most people in the United States fall into that category of what I would call a digital customer. It's not everybody, but it's a growing, mm. growing number that are living a lifestyle with digital at the center. You know, I think that uh, what companies need to do today, if they haven't, is to recognize that the audience of people that they would have called their customers 20 years ago have now become quote unquote digital customers. So I think companies today and, and in the future to be successful, they have got to win that audience of digital customers. And it's large, it's a majority and growing. And if they don't, then they, they can't possibly be relevant. You know, I mean, I hear this from my kids all the time. If they go on the website for a brand and then they don't have a good experience, their feeling is like, yeah, this brand is like, you know, it's like for my parents, it's like old fashioned. They don't get, it's not a brand for me. It's not a brand that resonates with me. It's a brand that has values that are different from mine. They don't care about what I care about. 
And if digital is at the center of your life, that's one of the things you care very much about. So if brands want to be relevant. They have to demonstrate, not just say, but actually demonstrate right. that they're doing, living the values that their audience, their customers care about. And, you know, an elegant digital experience is one of those values. It's not just a need anymore, but it is, it truly is a value that these digital customers hold. I think oftentimes, too, when you have, let's say, a company like Starbucks, who is most of the time pretty good about creating an in-person customer experience, that's usually pretty great. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But if their, let's say, their mobile app was not a great experience or was clunky or difficult to use, then those two things are dissonant and it does uh, affect how you you view the brand. Well, absolutely. Uh, and sure. I think what Starbucks has done brilliantly and they are one of the legacy brands, meaning brands that existed before this huge digital transformation that has done the best mm -hmm. at leveraging digital to create a highly resonant experience. Uh, what they yep. did is they figured out how to take the core elements of their brand and express them through digital. And this is the mm -hmm. ultimate hat trick. So let me give you an example. Experience was always a key part of the Starbucks brand, right? The, the warmth mm -hmm. and, and, you know, comfort of the coffee drink. The third the place. You know? Yeah, the Decades third place. Ago, yeah. Schultz was talking about the third place. Not home, it's not work. Yep. They created these environments with the big plush chairs and, you know, a place that you could hang out, Wi-Fi. It was very important to create a great experience, not just sell you coffee. But the experience mm -hmm. of ordering and paying was not differentiated. You showed up at Starbucks, you waited in line with everybody else, you told them what you wanted, you paid, and you didn't pay at Starbucks any different than you pay at Walmart. You give me your card, they run it, you know, right. this, because that was one part of the experience that frankly they hadn't addressed or differentiated. It was just normal retail. And then they realized that, that they could use digital to transform that experience so that you could you know, order in advance and pay with your, your Starbucks prepaid, you know, account. And uh, mm -hmm. they transformed that and, and have seen huge growth in sales as a result. That's remarkable. Um, I do want to go back to your book. You know, as we, as I have these conversations with extraordinary uh, customer experience thinkers like yourself, um, you know, we talk about a large variety, a wide variety of books out there about CX. Um, as you looked at that sort of catalog, that library that was already out there, what was missing that you thought I can address this issue, or there's a problem that I don't feel like has been addressed. Therefore I want to write this book now. You know, there's a lot of people who are working at large companies who are thinking, I know how to make it better, but it's not happening. <laughs> I'm not getting the funding. I'm not getting the support. I don't have alignment between different parts of the organization. You know, I can't get a vision that everyone can sign on to. Um, you know, I, I don't have a process that will let me get from where the company is, which may be some fragmented different digital channels, which don't have all the capabilities and don't have an elegant user experience and whatnot to where they really need to be. And so what I try to do is, because that's what I've been doing for the last 25 or whatever years of my career, which is working with really big brands, and how to undergo the transformation to create better digital experiences for customers and get better performance, better financial results. You know, there's a lot involved. Mm. And so that's what we really try to tackle is if you're sitting there at a big company and you're like, I need to, I need to drag this company into the 21st century or, or whatever, into the, into the 2020s. Um, this is your blueprint to do that. And I, I, you know, it's just a combination of digital strategy, change management and organizational transformation. And, and it's rooted in our approach in customer research, because I believe the customer research doesn't get the important credit that it needs as the foundation of all great customer experience. And also in many cases, the foundation of a persuasive story to get organizations to make the enormous investments that are often necessary in order to, um, you know, make these transformations. In fact, one thing about Starbucks, do you know where Starbucks came up with the idea of their stored payment cards from? Did you know that story? No. So no. here's what they did. Um, they were, I forget when, I think it was around 2007, 2008, when the economy tanked and like, Starbucks was closing stores and, you know, people were tightening yeah. the belt, so they weren't paying $3 for a cup of coffee. Starbucks did some customer research 
And one of the things they discovered something interesting, and this to me is just the sort of thing we always need to be looking for in customer research, which is not how do we validate what we think we know, but what, what's, what's going to surprise us that we didn't know. Hmm. So one of the many things they looked at was gift cards. How are people using gift cards? And what they found was something unexpected, which is that many people, the majority of gift cards purchased at Starbucks were not given as gifts. People were buying right. these gift cards for themselves. They buy a 50 or hundred dollar gift card and then use it to pay for their coffee over time. That's not the purpose of the gift yeah. card, but that's what people were using them for. And so that made Starbucks realize that there was a customer need that wasn't being well met, which was people were looking for an easier, simpler way to pay that they didn't have to run their credit card every single time, or perhaps because they yeah. wanted to be able to budget or know how much they were spending on Starbucks for whatever underlying reason that people preferred the gift card. There was a need that was being met by a workaround of customers using gift mm. cards, which wasn't their intended purpose. That insight is what led Starbucks to create a much more, you know, a, a pre a stored value card that was much more intended and geared for it to be your Starbucks card. And once they knew that it was your Starbucks card, then they could tie things like loyalty programs to it and give you extras and perks. Yep. And they could get the kind of insight that you often don't have as a retailer into knowing you know, what's the total value of that customer? And then they could reward that customer and reward based on your, your, your purchases and stuff like that. Your goal is to more effectively drive customer behavior, including what they do and also how, what they think and feel. And in order to do that, you really have to understand these customers that you're trying to influence. If you don't, you're, you're, you're flying blind. And so I think that that is the foundation. And that's one of the things, probably a fourth or more of the book, it just goes into how to conduct customer research and a wide range of different techniques mm -hmm. With, that all have one goal, which is to really understand and, and, and have, a, they have the humility to recognize that most companies and most executives of companies, while they, of course, understand some things about their customers, they don't understand everything. And sometimes they're missing an insight that could be, like in this case with Starbucks, the key to an enormous growth opportunity. And so... Uh, that I think is one of the things that's just huge in the book. I think that's great. And it, you know, to, to the success of something that speaks to the success of Starbucks platform. Uh, I used to manage Starbucks stores in Manhattan. I had a lot of stores, um, in and around wall Street, And, um, yeah, it was, uh, taught me a lot about customer experience. Did you manage the um, one on broad street Starbucks. near 55 broad? Yeah. Oh. I did. I'm not kidding. I went to that store all the time. Uh, so, so anyway, what I was what I was saying was, oftentimes customers would come in, and if their uh, card or their app uh, ran, had run out of money, instead of just paying the difference with another credit card or debit card or something like that, they'd say, "Let me refill my Starbucks right. card." Yeah, and, and this kind of goes into the design thinking that you talk to that you talk about in in your book quite a bit. Uh, when it comes to customer experience, uh, unpack the design thinking and how brands can integrate that concept for their care agents and their customers. For their care, yeah, design thinking to me, if I were to sum it up in like you know thirty seconds or less, r really just says this: for thousands of years, people have come up with ideas and implemented them. That's not a new idea. Mm. The, 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 the middle stage of design thinking is ideation, but that's not new. There are new techniques for ideation, but the core of design thinking is says, but there's really something we need to do before ideation, and there's something we need to do after ideation to be successful. Before we ideate, we should make sure we really empathize. In other words, same thing we were just talking about before, mm. basically understand the customer. Let's not just come up with ideas right. that sound good to us in a conference room on a whiteboard, but let's make sure they're rooted in understanding you know, what the customer's points of pain are, because that's where the money's going to be. We can solve our own needs. We can say, what I would like, if I'm the CMO of Starbucks, what I would like in Starbucks is X, Y, Z. Well, that's great, but you know, how much money are we going to spend to make me happy um, versus the thing that's going to make the most business impact? So that's the first thing. And then to prototype and test, to say, you know, you have an idea that you think is awesome. Before we go spend millions of dollars building it, there's a number of specific techniques that can be used that are low cost that we can test these ideas and see which work. Because a lot of ideas, that seem good, even if they're based on customer needs, turn out not to be quite something that's going to be successful. I mean, uh, a Gartner says 90% of all new products in the marketplace fail. So how do we avoid that trap? And a lot of that's through testing and, and, and prototyping. And so there's more to design thinking than that, of course, but that's the kind of basics of it that says, let's not just come up with ideas. 
Let's root them in the customer and then let's test them with the customer before we spend a lot of money implementing them. I'm curious if you tried to move the needle for a business or a corporation or brand that they were just so resistant on and you feel like, man, if they'd only followed my consultation and my advice, maybe they could have gotten over this hurdle. Right. Well, um, and the, the truth is that every single company that I've worked with in my career faces resistance to change when implementing something. Well, here's an example. Um, I've worked a lot in the rental car industry. And hmm. one of the things that my clients in the rental car industry want to do is make it quicker and easier for customers to get to their car and get off the line because we know that's a better experience. And it is also true that when you wait in line and then go to the counter and get your rental car, it is an opportunity for the person behind the counter to make sure that you're aware of some of the opportunities to add additional products to your rental car reservation, such as a GPS or an insurance plan. And so car rental companies would really like you to get the benefit of those insurance plans and they would like the revenue that is associated with it. And, you know, if you jump in the car and drive off the lot and get into an accident, you may be really sorry that you didn't have that insurance and you didn't have the opportunity to have that, have that conversation. So there's a trade off here. You know, there is something lost in creating a more efficient process. And of course, one of the questions we always try to answer is, well, but, but can we fix that with digital? Can we help make sure you understand when you rent your reservation online, what these options are? And of course, yes, we do all those things. And yet it may also be true that there's nothing like the face-to-face -face conversation to have effective sales. And so there's the true downside to it. And so um, what do you do with that? You know, uh, uh, you have to acknowledge it and you have to sort of look at the aggregate upside. But I guess what I'm trying to say is it, all the resistance is not craziness, you know? <laughs> it's not all just difficult people. Sometimes transformations create better experiences. They don't immediately generate revenue. Sometimes they, they hmm. create risk for revenue in other areas. And there's reasonable reasons for someone to say, there's some downsides to this stuff too. So you have to be able to look at the aggregate and say, you know, a lot of business decisions have upsides and downsides and you have to use storytelling and other persuasive techniques like data and customer research to be able to paint the full picture to help support the decision-making of companies to hopefully make the right decision. For example, there's a lot of experiences where there are, and I see this more and more, there are things that are designed to make the experience more secure, captions and other things, and they make the experience worse. Now, of course, the experience of having your data stolen is really, really bad, <laughs> but, yeah. but in the moment when you're dealing with the hassle of the security components of the experience, they, they degrade the experience. And so you have these trade-offs between security and experience, between cost and experience, between sales opportunities and experience. And so uh, my job as a consultant working in these areas is to try to do my very best to tee up for decision makers so they see the full picture. And if I have an opinion about the way they should go, I try to make sure that I'm communicating that persuasively. They could be just resistant because I control the call center and it's my domain, you know, and I don't want my account mm -hmm. produced even if it's the best for the company. Yes, that, that exists, there's no question. And you always have to be looking out for sabotage because people will look out for their own interests. And also there's reasonable questions to be asked about any proposed investment or any proposed change. It's my opinion that they should have taken 100% of my recommendations because I wouldn't have recommended it. <laughs> and yet not everybody takes 100% of what I recommend or what my teams recommend. In fact, very often they don't. They shape our recommendations mm. into their final decisions. Mm. You made me uh, think of a review of one of your books, <laughs> and I want to read this. Okay. I should say it's a five-star review, okay. and it says, must have for any business. Uh, this reviewer says, I'm a small business, just me and a couple of contractors, but I've worked at old retail companies that are struggling to turn the ship fast enough to keep up with a more and more digitized world. Um, he also says, I loved this book. Not only did it have great information, but dare I say, it was also very entertaining to read. If you're starting a business or in charge of an old one, I highly recommend you read this book. And so do I, so much so 
that if you're listening to this podcast right now and you love it and you love what Howard has to say or you have other opinions about it, share it on whatever social platform you are on and tag it with hashtag CXWise and we will send you a copy of Howard's book because I agree it is a must have for any business. It seems like today tech adoption would be, um, you know, a no brainer, but sometimes there are just like this person said, old retail companies who are still struggling when it comes to digital experiences. Why do you think that is? What are the, the holdouts? Is it just budget? Is it, well, change is hard. Is it, you know, decision by committee? What are you um, what are you seeing that the the reasons or the blockers that people still are holding out? Yeah, well, you, you said on a, a bunch of them. I think I think you, you've got the right idea there. I think that um, I mean, nobody is out there saying we're not investing at all in technology. Right? Everybody's not right. technology. The question is, right. what should they do next? And uh, I think that, um, of course, anytime you want to drive change, that means risk. And there's always people mm -hmm. that are averse to risk. And that's not unreasonable. You know, of course, budget's always an obstacle and it should be an obstacle because we should only spend money in a business if it's gonna, if it's gonna have a meaningful impact. Um, I think a lot of companies don't have a clear vision of what is the experience mm. they really need to create in order to be more successful. I think some companies have a problem with their technology stack and they know that there's a, mm. a, a experience they'd like to deliver, but it feels like, like nobody's career is long enough to get to where they need to go, to get out of the legacy debt, to deal with the technology. Sometimes it's personalities. There's people who, you know, are very powerful within an organization who, you know, over their cold dead body, when we get rid of Siebel or whatever, you know, and, and <laughs> you know, it, it becomes a barrier. You know, there's, there's lots of reasons um, and, and so on and so on. But um, it's not it's not a game for the faint of heart, but it can be very rewarding, uh, but it's challenging with these big organizations. So. Yeah, I mean, there's lots and lots of reasons between what you, your question and some of the things I just said. But what, what I try to do in the book is provide the solution. And what's the solution? Start with customer research, create a clear, compelling vision of what the future state experience needs to be and why it will influence customers' behavior in a way that aligns with your business goals. Then create a roadmap. How do you get there? What changes are needed to deliver that vision? What's it going to cost? And then work on it chunk by chunk, piece by piece to implement different products and different technology changes that are gonna enable you to move you towards that North Star vision of the overall experience. Um, and now, of course, with economic headwinds and budget cuts coming at a lot of companies, there's all these questions about, you know, well, is this initiative gonna return ROI in 2023? And if not, we should stop, right. you know, these are the daily battles that people who are trying to help their companies be successful in the future, especially tough with public companies where they have to answer to shareholders on a quarterly basis. It's, it's a tough landscape. Right. Well, listen, Howard, this has been such such a great conversation. I know I have learned so much. Uh, I've taken up too much of your time, I know, but uh, thank you so much for your CX wisdom. Thank you for your time. I know you have made us all CX wiser. <laughs> so thank you, Howard Tiersky. I really appreciate your well, time. Thank man. you so much for having me. It's been it's been a pleasure.